module 1.6 and this is where we kind of start segueing a little bit into what's going to be a, a major uh, topic for the next couple of classes data models so what is a data model or what's a model uh, at all and then what's the difference in kind of these different uh, levels of modeling at the conceptual logical and physical model and who's uh, really going to be interested in each one of those and so this is uh, what well, one of my favorite quotes ever so this is uh, this image here is uh, George Box he is a uh, or well, is was I think he may have passed away recently actually but uh, was a mathematician and uh, he has this quote all models are wrong but some are useful all models are wrong but some are useful i don't know why we would even bother with models if they're all going to be wrong why are all models wrong and think about it for a minute like is this uh, so we have a model of an airplane here right does this model really faithfully represent an airplane is is this a very accurate representation i don't i don't know it's uh it's much smaller than an actual airplane if someone have uh, any thoughts on uh how this is different from an actual airplane? It has a stem. Because it's small, it does a stem. The, okay, it doesn't have doesn't have the inner workings. I think this probably couldn't actually fly, right? Maybe no engine, no no doors. So I guess we could make this a better model of an airplane by like giving it some of the inner workings, right? We could put an airplane engine and working windows and doors and stuff in there and working landing gear. We could make it the full size of an airplane. It would actually be a more accurate model, a less wrong model, a more correct model if we did that. But then eventually, if we make the airplane bigger and bigger and bigger and then give it a working engine and working landing gear and working doors and working windows and put seats in there and what eventually happens it becomes it becomes different like an actual airplane yeah it, it becomes an actual airplane right it ceases to be a model of an airplane and it becomes an airplane right so by virtue of being a model it can't perfectly represent what it is a model of so all models are wrong, but some are useful. So are there some use cases? Are there some ways in which this model of an airplane is actually more useful than an actual working airplane? I don't know. Imagine you were trying to teach someone about airplanes and describe to them about airplanes and show them like, uh, let's imagine this had some moving parts on it, like the landing gear actually worked, right? It's very hard to observe the landing gear on an actual airplane, right? Because the landing gear has to be down when it's on the ground where you can see it. It has to be flying through the air and moving to see it retract. But if I can pick up this model and turn it upside down and show you the landing gear doors and how they would open and close, right? And maybe I can demonstrate more effectively on a model kind of the airfoil design of the wings and put it in, put this smaller wing into a wind tunnel and show you how the air flows over it more effectively than I could on a larger airplane, right? So in some ways, this model of the airplane is actually more useful than if we were trying to do this with an actual airplane, right? So even though the model is wrong, it can be useful. And really, the usefulness of it comes out of this idea that a model is a simplified expression of, of an observed or unobservable reality used to perceive relationships in the outside world.
See, I like this quote almost as much as the other one. It's a lot to unpack here. A simplified expression of observed or unobservable reality. Okay, so this model of an airplane, this is an observed reality, right? This is a physical thing that exists, right? And we can simplify it to be able to get a better idea of how it works. Make it smaller, put it in a wind tunnel, uh, whatever, right? So that's a, a, an observable reality, but what is an unobservable reality? I would suggest that this class, like Business Analytics 6354, it's an unobservable reality. Like you can't take a Business Analytics 6354 and hold it in your hand and weigh it and see it and, and touch it, right? It's not a real thing, but it is a real thing, right? Like you guys are in this class, you're paying for this class, you're getting credit for this class. like. It's a thing that exists, but it's a thing that we can't observe, right? But we can create a model to describe it, right? Because this course has attributes. It has a name. It has a course number. It has a time that it's offered. It has a number of learning objectives that have to be met in order for you to take the course, right? It has a number of credit hours associated with it. So we can create a model that describes this class, or at least describes the most important things that we want to know about this class and describe this unobservable reality, right? And even for realities that are observable, like you as a student, does the University of Houston really care about every aspect that makes you up as a person? Like the University of Houston is really concerned with a simplified expression of you as a student, right? They've modeled you as having a PeopleSoft ID and a first name and a last name and uh, an address, a phone number, an email address, a major, whatever courses you're enrolled in, whatever your uh, tuition and outstanding fees and stuff like that are. They haven't captured a lot of data necessarily about your uh, hopes and dreams and your childhood expectations and your uh, eye color and your hair color. Like these aren't things that make up the model of a student that the uh, that the university is you know interested in from a business perspective, right? So there's a simplified model of you as a student that captures like kind of functionally what we need to know, right? And your entity, your object in this model is then in a relationship with this other entity of Business Analytics 6354, right? And whatever other classes you're taking. And we use this data model to uh, capture kind of your progression through the degree program, right? So all of this data modeling becomes our blueprint for designing databases, right? Understanding what attributes we care about, about our students and about our classes and about our professors and our staff and our buildings and uh, things like that is how we're going to design our database. So these models work at three different levels, at the conceptual model, at the logical model, and at the physical model. Okay, and these are going to be kind of a stepwise progression of getting more and more technical specificity. So at this point, I want to walk through just a short vignette of a business case about uh, this hypothetical dog grooming service. We're going to call it Dave's Dog Wash or DDW. And as we read through this story, we're going to create an entity relationship diagram and every noun that we encounter, or at least most of the nouns we encounter, we're going to model as entities in this, uh, in this model. Okay. So customers of Dave's dog wash own dogs. Okay. Employees of Dave's dog wash groom dogs. There are multiple locations of Dave's dog wash that employees can work at. And dogs can be dropped off at any location. Okay, so this is just a very 
basic kind of story about a business, a business case that we want to design a database for. So uh, our nouns here are going to be entities in this model. So we have customers of Dave's Dog Wash own dogs, employees, groom dogs, and we already have dog there. There are multiple locations that employees can work at. Dogs can be dropped off at any location. So I think we've captured all of the important entities in this story. Now we're going to read through the story again, and we're going to look at the verbs that describe how these entities interact with one another. Okay, So customers of Dave's Dog Wash own dogs. Okay, So there's a relationship between customer and dog that a customer owns a dog, or a dog is owned by a customer. We can read this in either direction. Employees of Dave's Dog Wash groom dogs. So there's a relationship between the employee and the dog that an employee grooms a dog. There are multiple locations of Dave's Dog Wash that employees can work at. Okay, So an employee works at a location and dogs can be dropped off at any location. So dogs are dropped off at a location. Okay, so. What we've done here is take the first steps toward a conceptual data model that is kind of a graphical representation of, at a very high level, how we are going to design this database to capture these business requirements. Okay, And of course, there's a lot of attributes that we're going to have that also describe these entities. And these aren't described in the story, but as we progress through the semester, this is where we're going to be heading, right? That an employee is made up of all these related attributes of an employee ID, a first name, a last name, and maybe some certifications they have in like dog haircutting or dog shampooing or dog first aid or whatever. Dogs are made up of a collection of attributes, their ID number, a name, weight, breed, and an age. And customers are just a collection of these related attributes of a first name, last name, phone number, email address, and a city, state, zip, and, uh, and street address, right? And so what we're going to do are take all of these attributes and in our conceptual schema, define that, hey, these are the attributes that make up a dog. And these are the attributes that make up an employee. And these are the attributes that make up a customer. And then also in the conceptual schema, define that employees have a relationship with a dog that they groom them. And then there are some other symbols we see here that we're going to be talking about next week that define the structural constraints of our database. So whether employees have to groom dogs, whether dogs have to be groomed by employees, that's the participation constraints, whether employees uh, groom only one dog or if they're going to groom a lot of dogs, and vice versa, if a dog is groomed by only one employee or if they might be groomed by multiple employees, that's our cardinality constraints. And again, we're going to be talking about this more uh, in next week's class, but this is kind of how we start in a graphical way capturing the business requirements, okay? And so in this conceptual model, this is what a data analyst would generate and then take back to the business and describe to them and kind of explain how this works. This is how we think the database should be designed. And it gives a little bit of more specificity to these fuzzy requirements that the, uh, that the business person is going to have. And it's an iterative process of uh, kind of defining our understanding of the business requirements and describing that back to the, uh, the business users until we kind of come to agreement on things. From here, we take our conceptual schema and create our logical schema, which is kind of a text version of our conceptual schema. And this gets us in a place where we are much closer to the SQL code, our data definition language code, that we're going to use to actually create the tables and the relationships in the database. Okay, So this is kind of the transition from the graphical to the code. And then the next step is we're going to write our SQL code, or our data definition language code, to create the physical schema. Okay, so we basically take our logical schema and we add in these special keywords and commands 
uh, in SQL to actually create the tables and it will wind up looking something like this. So we create our employees table that's gonna have these attributes of these data types and with some specific constraints, this has to be unique, these have to be, uh, have to be present, they can't be null and uh, some things like that. So don't get freaked out by this just yet. Uh, this is what we'll be writing in a couple of weeks and it will all uh, make a lot of sense. And then going kind of one level past this physical schema is the physical design of the database itself, which is going to be outside the scope of this class. Uh, but this is where we start looking at uh, more tweaking of the internal schema and uh, doing hashing and indexing and different uh, techniques for distributing data across our file system. But where we're going to be stopping in this class is really at writing the SQL code. All right, so our data model is just a way that we can uh, kind of simply express and describe some observable or unobservable reality. And we're going to, in the context of this class, uh, be creating data models for conceptual, logical, and physical schemas. So the conceptual model being kind of intended for interacting with our business users and perhaps uh, somewhat less technical people. The logical model being a slightly more precise representation of our conceptual model. So this is where you start translating from business people to technical people. And then the physical data model is uh, strictly technical in nature uh, and used to actually create our, our tables and relationships in the database.